What's up, everybody? Waiting for my cousin Pete to hop on. He's sort of the impetus behind this entire endeavor. Oh, I don't want to start without him. What's up, gents? Yo. There he is. Your boy, Cruz. What's going on, man? Thanks for joining in. Okay, um, so guys, I'm going to be streaming this, and it'll be helpful, I think, so you can see what's going on in my stream, or excuse me, my screen. So if you want to tune in to twitch.tv slash alec and just mute it, uh, I think that will work just fine. Sounds good. What's up, Brant? Welcome. Thanks for showing up, Daug. I know you're a big Eve guy. Or you would like to be. <laughs> All right. Let's get this thing started. Uh, if anyone's not ready, just let me know now. And we'll take a break. But I think we have everybody here that we expected to be here. I don't know how long I'll be able to be here, but I'm here. Well, I don't think this will be super long. Um, feel free to ask me questions as we go. Uh, no question's a bad question. This is really for for you guys uh, to give you a sense of the layout of the EVE universe, uh, especially if you're a new player or someone that hasn't really been tuned in to the like larger political dynamics of the EVE universe and how that all interacts. So it's a great learning opportunity. It's a huge subject, so we're probably not going to get to everything. But like I said, if there's something you want to dive deep on or something you didn't understand or something you're curious about, just let me know. And likewise, in the stream chat, uh, I'll try to take questions from there as best I can. So the first thing is, let's start at the center. And this is the areas of high sec and low sec. These are the areas which most of you have are familiar with. Um, we've got Saint Laison sort of in the center there, and that's where Basgarin is. And it has a lot of overlap with every shore if you look at it in this top down way. Most of Eve navigation is conducted top down and in this arrangement, and in that way you have a north, south, east, and west uh, based on the relation of those territories to the center of the galaxy in Empire Space. Some of these gray areas are in fact null sec. Uh, specifically, outer ring over here on the uh, western half. Syndicate. Hey, what's up, Kirby Rocket? Whoa, nice emotes, dude. That's cool. Um, and then Great Wildlands down here in the lower right. These NPC areas are, like I said, they're null sec, but they are not player-controlled space, unlike the more colorful parts of the map that we're looking at right now, which I'll provide a link for in the chats. Probably should have done that to begin with, but I didn't. This is kind of like the definitive map of EVE control. Um, each area is color-coded depending on who owns it, and it's updated daily, so it's pretty accurate. Like I said, Outer Ring, Syndicate, Great Wildlands, they are not player-controllable, at least in the official sense. In the practical sense, alliances that are too... that used to hold space, but are too weak to hold it, who hold space but are looking to attack someone else's space, 
or they're in low sec and they're getting too strong for low sec or just not interested in doing it anymore and they want to start making the jump to null sec space. Some combination of these groups, or people that just like living in null sec so they can fight all the other groups I just mentioned, that's the population uh, in these places. The most active of which is Syndicate over here in the western half. Uh, because of its arrangement, you can see that it's sort of braced by two regions, Placid over here and Solitude. And you can't quite tell from looking at it in this way, but if you were to look at it from um, like a flat down... Oh, my, is my stream fucked up? Uh, Brant is saying, no, it's not. It looks okay in OBS. Uh, if it's an issue on Twitch, let me know and I'll restart it. Uh, but if you were to look at this in a more simplified map like you do on Dotland, which most of you guys are familiar with, you will see that Syndicate, from right about here, going all up in here, that little snaky edge of it, that's just basically a U. It goes from one part of Placid to the other. And uh, it's basically a PvP card, or you can come in one end and basically roam out the other end and look for people in that card or doing the same thing. Likewise, you can camp the entrances and try to get people there. Uh, and then there's this other entrance also to Placid that's somewhat less used. And then it breaks down here into Solitude, which itself bridges into Iridia, which is kind of the gateway to all this space down here. One key thing to not miss is the physical gaps on this map. You'll see this black space all up in here in the middle, the huge gaps over here in between Great Wildlands, for instance, and Molden Heath, Molden Heath and Ethereum Reach. Uh, if you look at Iridia and Corazor, these massive holes in space. If you're using stargates, which are the little lines that connect all these white dots, you don't really notice these, other than it makes systems really big. It takes a long time to warp across them. But if you're using a jump drive, that takes into account light years, not gate jumps. And light years are physical space. And in that way, these large gaps create effectively bottlenecks where if you plan on using capital ships, which are essentially a requirement for strategic warfare in EVE, you have to plan around these gaps. That's why things like the NETC exist, which has a network of citadels that you can use to safely traverse, say from all the way down here in Tashmurkan to all the way up here in Lone Trek without losing your super capitals. But that requires planning, because not all ranges are created equal. Even though, say, this jump in Great Wildlands is only one gate jump, it's extremely difficult to make with a capital ship. In fact, you might not be able to. You might have to go up through here where it's smaller, which means if you know that, you can position capital-killing assets at this juncture and sort of focus your efforts there. There are a couple, uh, a couple systems like that which are just natural choke points because... In order to get from one important place to another important place, just like gates in LOSEC, there are certain systems which essentially must be traveled through unless you want to go way out of your way. And those systems tend to be focal points in LOSEC. There are also some subcapital choke points that I want to touch on before we move on. Um, if you look at domain, and the Citadel, you'll notice this long pink line in the middle here. And that is essentially the superhighway between Jita and Amar, the two most active trade hubs and very populous areas. The Citadel and Kaldari space generally, all up in here, is the most populated area of the game, followed by Amar, followed by Galenti, and then over here is the Mimitar areas, they're the most sparsely populated Empire space. The traffic that goes through the Domain Citadel pipe is incredible. It's constant and it's expensive. People putting freighters through, moving expensive ships from one place to another to fit them or sell them. Um, 
huge quantities of minerals will travel, tr uh, traders buying low and trying to sell high at a different trade hub, all goes through there. And it's not that many actual jumps, it's like 15 or something, 15, 16. So it's very convenient. And what you'll see is a lot of suicide ganking along this pipeline. Likewise, uh, I'm not exactly sure where it is on this map, but somewhere between Galenti space over here and Kaldari space over here is a system called Rancer. Rancer is another gank spot, but this is for uh, smart bomb ganking in low sec. They'll position, excuse me, they'll position multiple battleships to the edge of the gate and they will just smart bomb the shit out of anything that is trying to move through. So any shuttles, interceptors, frigates, cruisers sometimes will all fall to these camps. And anything larger will be caught by conventional means. And the traffic is pretty decent. That's why, yeah, unless you're looking for a fight, you should add Rancer to your avoid list. Because there's really no good reason to go through it. It's only a few jumps to go around it. And it's extremely dangerous to actually pass through. Doubling back, there are these high traffic areas which I just touched on. They're not the only ones, but that's many of them. And then there are really low traffic areas, and that brings me to back to the uh, the jump range thing. If you go down here into Iridia, say, Corazor and Conid, there's not much down here. Like, if you don't live in the area, or you're not trying to get over here to these Nullsec regions, there's no reason to be here. There are no active trade hubs. It's not rich in natural resources. It's not compelling geographically. You're not getting a lot of traffic between one important place and another important place. It's just kind of there. Furthermore, uh, Iridia, for instance, and Solitude are both isolated by large stretches of low sec, which means conventional travel is really dangerous. Um, Yes, the population is low, but you can die, I mean, through the entire trip. And if you're planning strategically or just trying to make a living somewhere, that's not great compared to Empire Space, especially if you're not really a hardcore PvP player. What's up, me, Turner? How you doing? Also a nice emote. I like that. <laughs> so, why do people go down here? Well, some folks just live here for the PvP. Some folks are here hunting capitals because there are a lot of capital choke points. Anyone that's trying to get a capital ship from Empire Space back out to anywhere in this like southwesterly region has to go through here. And there are very few places that they actually enter from. Therefore, you uh, are really good at killing capital ships and getting them while they're in transit. This is essentially a super highway to you, but not really to normal people. And there's people that are basically staging here to invade, usually Delve, uh, which is down here, um, sometimes Fountain up here. Um, there are only a few places where you would want to stage for that too, so a lot of the activity is very concentrated. Anyone have any questions on Empire Space or NPC Nullsec before we move on to the player-controlled areas? Okay. Uh, and then, any, like I said, any questions from the chat, just throw them out there. I'll get to them as I see them. Um, let's move on to the deep NPC null sec. So, Syndicate, Outer Ring, Great Wildlands, all places you can get to from Empire. Molten Heath, you know, Solitude, Placid, Black Rise, Lone Trek, you can, you can get up all on there. Oh, Kirby, if you don't understand EVE as a whole, I mean, I'm willing to answer general questions as well. This is very informational, so if there's anything you wanted to know, you can just ask. I'll, maybe I'll answer it at the end, but don't hold back, buddy. <laughs> I love your emotes, man. Um, there are also NPC regions which are not accessible. And that would be down here in the south, Stain. This big blob right there. And up here in the north, Venal. Stain and Venal are very interesting. 
in that unlike the other NPC Nullsec areas of Great Wildlands and Syndicate, Venal and Stain are actually pretty good. Uh, Venal in particular has a lot of valuable natural resources and excellent ratting. You can get great faction drops there. It's extremely possible to make a living out there. And if you have the strength to control the moons, which are the strategic resource of Eve, then you can make a lot of money in Venal without having to worry about the maintenance, say, of you know, a lot of these player-controlled areas in terms of infrastructure, because everything's NPC. Stain is not quite as lucrative, and it's also much more difficult to get to. However, that's also a strength in some ways, and it's historically been the kind of holy land of a group called Stain Wagon, which are a, a Russian-based coalition of EVE alliances that have persisted for many, many, many years. And they essentially live in Stain, and then if there's ever an opportunity, they'll push out into Ketch, they'll push out into Impasse, they'll push out into Esoteria, even as far as Faithabolus, to take player-controlled space. They'll milk it for as long as they can. And then when an invasion comes, they turtle up back into Stain, and no one can really dislodge them. Uh, and by being there, they also control, in terms of influence, a great deal of capital ship transit between these uh, relatively more north regions and the far south regions of Esoteria and Paragon Soul, which will drive some political arrangements, which we'll touch on in a sec. What's up, Zarelli? Hi, Zarelli! I'm doing good, dude. I miss you. How you been? Triple A shit, yes. <laughs> um, so now we're going to get into the player controlled space, which is where a lot of the politics comes in. If you're in low sec and or you're in NPC null sec, you have some politics, but it's really politics of preference because it's rare. I mean, it's all it's not impossible, but it's much more difficult to force someone out of an NPC controlled area. You can't destroy the stations. You can annoy them and keep them trapped, but you know, that requires a lot of effort. Can't really hurt them in any way. And as such, it's very unlikely that any of these larger powers can really force out a group that's living in an NPC nullsec area if they wanted to. Whereas in player controlled space, that happens all the time, by definition. So there is much more of a a push for diplomacy and politics as a survival mechanism because without those kinds of arrangements you're often going to find yourself isolated and at a disadvantage to those that do engage in politics successfully. So what are the basis of EVE's politics? The fundamental basis of EVE is the corporation. That's what members join. Corporations join themselves up with alliances usually to achieve strategic goals or in some cases just corporate goals, like more people to play with, or maybe they need European players as well as American players to do something that they want to do, and they already have a European corp, maybe they'll partner with an American corp and form a team. Alliances are pretty strong. Some of them can be extremely strong. Uh, the really strong alliances tend to accumulate smaller vassals or for or sometimes they're vassals, sometimes they're pets, sometimes they're friends, sometimes they're proper allies, and they form what we call coalitions. The alliances, the corps are like the essential essence of Eve. The corp, the alliance is like the building block. It's the primary unit. Um, a lot of Eve is organized around alliances, which corporations join, leave, and create all the time, but that's sort of the defining element. Alliances then form coalitions, which are the strategically level things. This would be the difference of like the states forming America would be like corporations forming an alliance, but America forming NATO to go against the Warsaw Pact and Soviet powers would be the equivalent of coalitions. I'll give you a, a real world example. Depending on the situation of EVE in terms of its strategic balance, there have been 
usually two to four coalitions. The game has changed a lot mechanically, and so now there are, very, are a lot more coalitions. And even some of the coalitions have, you know, diplomatic relationships between each other. You know, you wouldn't say that China and Russia are in the same coalition, or the alliances that are, or the, uh, the nations that are favorable to those larger nations aren't really, like, necessarily on the same page. But at the same time, they do coordinate on certain things and have shared interests that are very different than Western powers. You see the same dynamic playing out in EVE whenever there are more than two superpowers. When there are two superpowers, <laughs> it's either a tenuous peace or an all-out war, usually one leading into the other. When you have multiple superpowers, things tend to be a little more chill, and there's a lot more like border conflicts and stuff. There's a lot, also a lot of proxy wars that happen. The let's start up in the north. Actually, no. Let's let's start in the south. This is interesting stuff. Uh, Southwest Goonswarm Federation. These guys are the core of one of the leading blocks in the game. They were formerly the Imperium, which were living up north. They had a war. It was called World War B. It was essentially six to eight month conflict, I think. Uh, potentially a little bit longer. Is a a huge undertaking. Uh, not as dramatic, unfortunately, as it as it probably could have been due to various factors. Uh, specifically, Goonswarm's strategic decision to conserve their super capital and capital fleet as much as possible, because they thought that you know deploying it would really wouldn't help them out that much. So they wound up losing the overall war, and all these guys up here in the north wound up taking their space. And they moved back down south and dislodged all the dudes living there, and basically the map just got flipped. Goonswarm is still extremely strong. They were not broken by that conflict in any way. Allied with them are the Initiative over here. And in a somewhat separate block, but not really, Red Alliance and Dream Fleet. Uh, Red Alliance is a Russian-based alliance that has a long-term strategic cultural relationship with Goonswarm. They've been allies for a long time due to circumstances of EVE's history. Uh, when Goonswarm was down and out and Red Alliance were down and out, they found friends in each other and formed basically a blood bond that led them to basically, from being broken alliances, back into superpower stardom for both groups. Ever since then, Red Alliance you know, hasn't really kept up in the terms of relative power to Goonswarm, but they're still very loyal to one another. But they're also Russians, which means there's a big language barrier there, and they're very subject to the politics of the Russian player block, which is a whole other animal. So they're essentially in two groups simultaneously. They're somewhat friendly with the Stainwagon crew, but they're also close allies with Goonswarm, who isn't against Stainwagon, usually, but is not really in their camp either. Now these other groups down here, like Volt, Kramenwafa, Cold Steel, they're sort of in a mini block by themselves, but they really only exist because Goonswarm wants to keep a buffer in this region of Quirius. They don't want to control it directly because they would overextend them, but they don't want to have it be taken over by a hostile power that could attack them in their more strategic and secure areas here in Delve. So these guys are like non-threatening groups they don't necessarily love, but don't hate, aren't really a threat. They could just keep them there and do their thing, and it's not really going to bother the goons that much. That's why they're there. Uh, let's go to the right. Um, interestingly, Test Alliance and Circle of Two, who you see down here, also used to live up in the north. Uh, Circle of Two was part of Goonswarm's previous coalition group called the Imperium. But during the course of World War B, they flipped after losing a significant chunk of their space because they didn't feel that Goonswarm adequately lived up to the expectation of defense they had for an ally. So they flipped over and started on the attacking front and became allies of Test Alliance, who used to live up here. But it was kind of a cramped arrangement. 
uh, test is a big alliance, very big alliance. Basically, the official Reddit alliance, or one of the two official Reddit alliances. The other one being Brave Collective, who they're allies with. Uh, and they're, so they're huge, like tens of thousands of people. So, they're a bit too small up there. They needed to make a change. And they didn't want to be located near this group that had evicted Goonswarm, because it was just too boring. So they moved south shortly after Goonswarm did, ironically. And Test Alliance, Circle of Two, Brave Collective, and a few other of these smaller groups formed a group together, which I believe they're now called the Legacy Coalition. And they set up shop, once again, adjacent to Goonswarm. And it didn't take long before these two groups started fighting it again. It's not really an all-out invasion or anything, but there are definite border skirmishes happening. Up here, I'll, I'll go into the north. Now, the north is composed currently of all the groups that were in the winning side of World War B that evicted Goonswarm. Hey, what's up, Goat? Uh, the key group in here is Pandemic Legion, and the other key group is Northern Coalition. These guys are like the Red Alliance and Goonswarm of the Goonswarm and Red Alliance thing, except instead of focusing on cultural similarities and huge numbers of players, Goonswarm being the most massive alliance in the game. Instead, Northern Coalition and Pandemic Legion, while they do have some cultural overlap, initially started out as a purely strategic alliance, and they have since cross-pollinated enough that they're basically on the same page. Rather than focus on numbers, their focus is on high-skilled players and strategic superiority in terms of equipment. So Pandemic Legion, for instance, is known as the most competent large PvP alliance in the game. And between the two of them, NCDOT and Pandemic Legion have the largest known super capital fleets. And they're very willing to deploy them at any time because they have the most. They have the most experience using them. So they're fairly untouchable. Uh, not many people want to challenge them. As a result, they're swinging that dick all day long. Now with them are some other groups. Uh, Pandemic Horde is like the newbie version of Pandemic Legion. Lots of new players created basically with alphas in mind. Uh, they've established them here in Fade, and I think that's Cloud Ring. Uh, they were a bit in Pure Blind, but then they traded that space to Pure Blind Cartel, which I don't know too much about. But uh, they're a minor player. Um, you still see Initiative have some space up here. Uh, mostly for like PvP kind of outposting, but their main core area is down here. Along with Pandemic Horde, you've got Morty's Angels, who used to live in the NPC stations that are in Pure Blind. Both Pure Blind, Delve, and Geminate over here have NPC stations within a otherwise player-controlled area. Kind of an interesting dynamic there. Uh, Fountain has it as well. It's called the Fountain Core, basically five systems that are all NPC controlled with NPC stations. And you get a lot of PvP groups settling in there to have essentially risk-free risk -free fights with the uh, other alliances that live there. Now Mortis Angels was basically attacking Goonswarm constantly. Finally, when Goonswarm was deposed of their space by Pandemic Legion, Northern Coalition, Mercenary Coalition, some of the powers in Losec, and these guys up here in darkness, um, you know, they saw the opportunity to claim some space. So they recruited up and spread out. Solaris, I don't know too much about. Chaos Theory, I don't know too much about. Uh, darkness is another PvP alliance that was sort of in for the ride on taking out uh, Goonswarm. So they got a pretty great chunk of space. Um, that is Declan up here in the upper left-hand corner. Some of the best space you can have. It's very isolated and very rich, both in moons and in terms of ratting quality. So you can make great amounts of money there. They're not really... I mean, they're a good PvP alliance, but they're not really in a position where they can sharpen their talons because they don't have anyone to attack or be attacked by. But that also puts them in a great position to farm the shit out of the area and build up their strategic defense and money reserves. Likewise up here, uh, also pretty safe space. This is Branch. Generally speaking, whoever controls Tribute 
controls branch. And you need, generally have to invade via venal. That's because there are checkpoints. Essentially this, this little branch right here is mtecho, and it feeds up into branch. It's the most direct route. Going around it is adding a lot of time. I mean a lot of time to that trip. It's essentially impractical. If you can control tribute, you are like have a chokehold on these entire upper areas. Even if you personally can't control them, whoever does plan on living there basically has to be on your team. So you can dictate a lot of the policy up there. Now these guys aren't exactly blood brothers with NC dot and PL, but they have to be friendly with them just as a matter of course. The key alliance up here is League of Unaligned Master Pilots. You can, they're kind of covered up by this other group here. Um, but Lumpy is what they're called, and they're uh, Germans, and they're basically the PvP powerhouse up there. Um, some of the other alliances are remnants of a group called Drone Walkers, which had a schism. They were involved in the World War B thing. After World War B was over, they had some political disagreements about what happens next. The folks that wanted to stay up in Branch formed different alliances. I think actual Drone Walkers is down in the... Yeah, they're there. They're uh, down here in the catch area. Uh, Mr. Shiny says, what is that area with no players and no warp lines? Ah, so this right here, A821A, J7HZ, and UUA are Jove space. This is a mysterious race in the game. We haven't actually seen the, any of them. Uh, we only know about them from the EVE lore. We know that they were involved in creating Stargates and involved in creating the technology we use to fly our spaceships. And we know that that technology led them to ruin through some kind of degenerative biological disease. But beyond that, we don't know anything because they went out to these three regions and then cut all the gates off so no one could follow them. Uh, you can get to these, um, but essentially a GM has to take you there. So... If, for instance, the Alliance Tournament is fought on the actual live server, and when that happens, the GMs will teleport you to one of the Jovian systems. Otherwise, they're unget -toable. You can sort of see them. Uh, some players have tried to fly out to them by getting to like one of these edge systems and pointing at a star and going, but obviously no one's ever reached it. There's always the possibility they could be opened up someday. That would be a hell of an expansion. So this is Vale of the Silent. Um, sort of a weird region. Uh, it's very unusual that Vale of the Silent is controlled by a single entity. Usually it's split. Uh, in this case, Pandemic Legion taking the northern half and Infinity Space taking the eastern half. That leads us into Geminit which, before this area of the game existed over here, was essentially a backwater area, sort of in the same way Iridia is, but for low sec. It didn't really go anywhere, and there was no reason to be there, but you could go over there for a fight if the person that lived there was up for fighting you. Now that these areas were added, these are called the drone regions over here. I'll go over them in a second. It's now essentially become a buffer space, sort of like Quirius is for Delve. The groups that control Veil of the Silent and control the Kavala Expanse and Ethereum Reach are usually not on the same team, just because of the way the geography and the politics lays out. And that means there's usually a, a border or buffer area, the eastern part of Veil and the Geminate region, controlled by the north and the east, respectively. Right now, that's controlled by Everybody Lies and Advent of Fate. And you can see that Legion of X-Death has a few systems in there. And X-Death is the power in the drone regions, and they have been for a very, very, very long time. Sometimes they've been odds with this group Solar Fleet. Both are Russian alliances, and that means they play by Russian rules. Russians are the largest non-English speaking population in the game. And very few of them speak English at all. The result is that they have a totally separate culture and politics that 
I mean, not totally separate in that it intersects with the rest of the game an awful lot. But like the famous people, the FCs, the the backstabbings and the loyalties, all that stuff is inherent to their own community and it rarely breaks outside of that. So what you'll usually see is there's two or three groups that are vying for power within the Russian bloc itself. Death, Solar Fleet, and Red Alliance in some combination or iteration are competing for supremacy, which one is the most powerful Russian bloc. Sometimes they're all friends and they're going up against other people. Sometimes they're bitter enemies. And, and a stain wagon is also in there, although they're usually very independent from everybody else. Uh, but you know, occasionally when they break out into player-controlled space, they'll form alliances with one group or the other, depending on what's going on. And no one really knows what's going on because unless you read Russian, you you can't take check out any of their forums. You can't listen into any of their alliance meetings. You have no fucking idea. So it's sort of a black box for a lot of the game about the what goes on. Um, we only really hear about it when there's a huge civil war happening or when they're teaming up to go attack somebody else. The drone regions themselves are not considered very desirable. The reason is, you'll see these long fucking purple lines going in to the drone regions. It's extremely, and I mean extremely, difficult to establish yourself there. I was part of the land rush when the thing first opened up, and the Russians saw the promise of being there, and they went in in force and kicked everybody else out. But, you know, for anyone to try to get in there, like, you couldn't, this is at the start of it, you couldn't actually put carriers in here without jumping them to Nullsec. I forget which area it was. It was like somewhere in here, maybe through the Great Wildlands or something, but you had to go through dangerous Nullsec to even get your capital ships in there, because back then capital ships couldn't go through gates even if you wanted them to. And these big gaps made it almost impossible. I mean, you'd have to have max skills and some savvy politicking to get yourself in there. Otherwise, you had to build that shit from scratch, and very few people had the money, the infrastructure to do that, and the desire to do that. The Russians did. They moved in there, even though it was considered not very valuable space, not a lot of great moons, the rats there weren't particularly valuable, they didn't have any faction drops at the time, and there was nothing really going on. But they saw the value in having very isolated space, Especially for the Russians, because and I don't mean to generalize, but a lot of the Russian alliances engage in some shady practices, like selling ISK, or using bots to farm ISK. Um, even non-shady practices that would benefit from isolation, like selling their space to smaller groups in like a rental property type situation. That was all going on over there. And so they accumulated large swaths of space that no one wanted to attack, but a lot of people would pay to get in for because no one would bother them and they could do low-level nullsec stuff as much as they wanted. And so that's why you have what you have. The only uh, other group in there is Brothers of Tangra. I'm not 100% sure who owns it now, but basically it is the rental arm of Pandemic Legion, the northern group up here. They may have transferred ownership to X-Death at some point, uh, unclear on that, but at least for a long time they had huge patches of drone space as well, and they would sell it out while the actual Pandemic Legion roamed around the galaxy, beating up and killing whoever they wanted, and no one would fuck with their rental space because no one wanted to have Pandemic Legion come attack you. So that was a pretty solid investment on their part. Rotating down south, this is usually a very fractured area. Uh, back when I started playing, it was a little more homogenous. There were like three or four, maybe five big alliances. Now it's, it's definitely split up. The key alliances to keep in mind are, of course, Solar, which has half of Detorid. But there's also Triumvirate up here, which, while they don't control large amounts of space, are extremely well respected in terms of their PvP prowess. They're like a a mini Pandemic Legion, a very mini Pandemic Legion. They don't really have the super capital numbers that PL has, but they're very competent and they're very hardcore. 
So for the area, they pretty much dominate. There's also FCON, Fidelis Constance. Fidelis Constance used to be part of Goon Swarm's group. Um, they got their shit pushed in along with the rest of the Imperium in World War B. And they were the f one of the first to decide to put up, pull up stakes and go down south. They went by themselves, so they don't actually have any diplomatic friendliness with Circle of Two other than Alliances of Convenience. And they don't have any friendly relationships with Red Swarm, which is Goon Swarm and Red Alliance, other than their general familiarity. But they're so separated in terms of distance and, geograph and uh, political interest at this point, there's very little practical connection there. Uh, all the other alliances are either small independent groups that have sort of paired up with each other, or they're like, not pets exactly, but lower level allies or even perhaps renters of groups like Solar, FCON, Tri, and Test Circle 2. Like Wings of Wanderers, Band of Backstabbers, Army of New Eden. There are their own groups. Uh, certainly Army of New Eden is not sure about the other two. Um, but they're not really driving agents in terms of, uh, of of what kind of decisions happen in the region. They'll go with whatever direction these larger alliances that they're aligned to will go. And before we move out of there, we've got to talk about Providence. And despite being a single region and a... You know, ostensibly not very valuable one, doesn't have a ton of natural resources. Uh, in fact, the geography means it's super prone to being roamed in. It's much like Syndicate. Um, it's actually one of the most stable and prosperous regions in the game, and has been for years. It's held down by Curitaris Veritatis Alliance, which is a role-playing alliance that believes they are furthering the borders of the Amar Empire by cleansing Providence and holding it as the promised holy land that it is for the MR in terms of the lore. They have numerous alliances that control smaller constellations within Pravi, including some of these groups, Apocalypse Now, Ulai Federation, and then Severance is the really big one up here. They have started off as role players. So they uh, were involved in building the first outpost, uh, them and their Mimitar role-playing rivals, <laughs> which is an actual thing. Um, they've lost their space a couple times, but not as much as you might think, because you know few people want to invade Providence for uh, monetary reasons, and people kind of like to go there to fight, so no one really wants to kick them out that much. The only time that they've lost their space big time was when they made a political misstep and invaded a neighbor. Or excuse me, they allowed Severance to invade a neighbor. Or I think it was Volt, actually, back when Volt was in Providence. They allowed Volt to invade a neighbor, AAA, which was part of Stainwagon, which held the catch area over here. Volt overstepped their boundaries. CVA wouldn't walk them back, and the Seds decided to double down, and AAA was like, look, if you do this, we're going to kick you the fuck out. You can't take these systems. And they were like, well, we did. We claimed them for the MR. Like, come do something about it. And AAA did by steamrolling the fuck out of them. <laughs> and they got thrown out for about a year. But much like Stainwagon, eventually they came back to what they consider their ancestral homeland. And a unique part about them is, while it's largely a role-playing shtick, they are, brand-wise, a not-red-don't-shoot-it alliance. They believe that neutrals should be able to come into their space without being attacked. And if you do attack them, they'll put you on the red list and shoot you on sight. In practice, CVA will put you on the red list if they fucking feel like it. There's really no reason. Um, there's nothing stopping them from doing it. So the integrity of that list is <laughs> is somewhat up in the air. But in, you know, in practice, you'll see a lot more neutral traffic there than other places. And because they are so used to getting these reds coming in and roaming them, they'll actually form up for fights pretty damn regularly. So basically, the idea is you go into Providence with a small group, 
you roam through, try to get as many kills as you can, and make sure you have scouts, because CVA will form up a fleet to come catch you, and sometimes it'll be small enough that you can turn around and fight it, but most of the time it'll be so big you need to run. And then it's basically a race against the clock to get the fuck out of there before they lock you down and kill you. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I've personally had a long storied history with Providence. Uh, me and, and Noir have, have been involved. <laughs> uh, everything from one of our first contracts where they threw us on the red list for no reason, uh, to the time when we helped AAA evict them, to the time we actually held space after that eviction in Pravi, to when we gave them their first foothold trying to retake it because of some backstabby type stuff. Uh, re rebellions within Providence, which we were hired to participate in. There's a lot of stuff going on there that's cool. It's kind of its own thing. And finally, we have the the Far West. Yes, Zarelli, bend the knee. Knee unbent. No knees were bent in the process of that war. What a, what a fucking great thing. Oh my god. That was so much fun. Anyway. Uh, over here in the west, which is essentially fountain and a little bit outer ring and a little bit cloud ring. But cloud ring is eff effectively considered part of the north. The reason why I haven't talked about the west that much is that really a lot of the action is in the southwest. Fountain itself is interesting. It's It's got a lot of great natural resources but it's kind of awkward to get to. Like, the Empire entrance is in fucking Iridia over here, <laughs> which is the ass end of Losec. <laughs> like, it's the colon of Losec, <laughs> geographically speaking. <laughs> it's kind of like you're coming in here, you get sort of spit out uh, in the game into the lone track, and you move through the digestive track, and you kind of get pooped out at the system. And that'll take you into Fountain. So it's a huge pain to get to by non-capital ship means, and even by capital ship means, it's sort of a pain in the ass. Uh, you can go through Outer Ring, Syndicate, Cloud Ring to get there, but those are all null sec, which means it's a much more dangerous trip. Not everyone will make said trip. So the through traffic is not great in terms of convenience, but at the same time, they have that fountain core that I told you about, those five systems which are NPC-controlled, which the PvP alliances will base in just to fuck with everybody, which means that it's difficult to get to, hard to hold, in the sense that, like, if a group that's in Delve wants to expand or put someone that they're friendly with up in here, they probably can do it. And yet... Oh, and, and that Fountain Core group is constantly preying on your members for content and killing them all over the place. That, you know, it's it's not the greatest place to be in, just in terms of value. But there are a lot of great strategic resources in there. There are some systems where you can farm pretty well and get good amounts of money. But uh, generally speaking, the alliances that live in Fountain are... I mean, it's it's rare that they're powers in their own right, because usually if they are, they'll move down into Delve. The one exceptions I can think of are like Brave Newbies, which are currently in here, Brave Collective. They used to be a regional power over here. Likewise with Test, used to be a regional power over here. But those are what I would consider the exception more than the rule. Uh, the culture is not a, a bad alliance by any means, but it's just not in the same... Uh, tier as your goon swarms, your pandemic legions, your X deaths, your tests. Um, it just doesn't have that level of membership, that level of military projection power. But it's also not threatening goon swarm. It's not threatening the north. Um, so there's really no push to remove them. Uh, goon swarm was doing some pushes up here against gangbang and culture for the moons, but I I don't think that that kept up super long. I think they picked up a couple and we're happy with that. Goonstorm has to be careful they don't overextend themselves because they've got Test and Circle of Two over here pushing. Potentially could push against them so they got to be careful about how far they move. And I think that is everybody. 
There's a lot to cover and a lot to take in. So if I skip something, you want me to double back or you got a question about anything really, uh, don't be hesitant. I got definitely minutes to spare on the hour that I booked for this. So let me open it up for questions from the stream chat and from the Discord. Pete or Newt, you got any questions? Pick it up on comps. Oh, uh, you're good, Newt. Um, Bogdanovich, I know you've got questions because this is like your thing. You're the map guy. Yeah, I'm the map guy. I just, uh, you know, uh, taking taking it all in. Um, as of as of right now, it's just a pile of info. So you know. <laughs> yeah, it is a it is a big pile of info. Um. Let's say the other thing to keep in mind is that the jump ranges got slashed pretty harshly on capital ships. So uh, in previous layouts of the EVE map, you could have like a goon swarm project their power all the way over into FCON and Solar Fleet space pretty easily, like within a half hour or so. Likewise, they could go from the south to the north within about a 30 to 60 minutes with a combat force if they wanted to. Nowadays, it's much more difficult to do that. And even if you did it, you'd have an even harder time getting back just because of the way the game currently works. So that means a lot of things are much more regional than they used to be. Uh, it used to be that Pandemic Legion could you know, drop you no matter where you were, and if you deployed a Dreadnought, you were basically asking to die. Nowadays, it's not quite that. Um, but if you're fucking around... Anywhere that Pandemic Legion happens to be, you know, you're pretty screwed. Right now, I think NC Dot is based uh, here-ish, uh, Barleygate and Placid. So they're raiding Syndicate. They can raid Solitude. They can sort of raid Cloud Ring if they wanted to, but I think Syndicate's more the focus. And they're doing it for resources. They're doing it for content. A lot of stuff happens for content reasons. You know, these PvP alliances will take space as a natural byproduct of being better than the people that currently hold that area. But they don't want to just stay there because then their skills stagnate, the PvPers get bored and leave. They always have to find new content for their members, so that's why they'll frequently go on deployments to different areas where they don't have as many allies. And then they'll, they'll do stuff, uh, invade for fun, for instance, or do sort of what Initiative is doing up here, trying to take some space. Um, test yeah, circle yeah, two. I mean, oh, god, because you're playing the game for a reason. So, I mean, you know, what are you gonna do? Just sit around? Nah, you're, you're gonna go, you're gonna go fuck somebody up. Exactly. Speaking, exactly. speaking of that, what's your opinion on the anime war? I fucking love it. <laughs> I think it's great. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we'll talk about it in the next declarations of war, but the anime war is. Uh, Horde and Waffles basically against CVA and, and crew because apparently the the Discord's, uh, Discord or Slack, I forget, was so crazy, so filled with anime on the Horde side that they had to split it and be like, oh, no, no more anime. And that was like, it drove the, the anime lovers of the group crazy. Apparently they had a lot of them. And uh, Jin Tan, who is the head FC of CVA, and you will recognize him as a host of the Declarations of War podcast, apparently was on another podcast and heard about this decision and called the person that implemented it a fucking cunt or something along those lines. And that was like, oh, well, I'll bring anime back if you kill this guy ten times and bring me his corpse. And then the guys that wanted the ban, were like, oh, that's not fair. It's like, okay, well, if you kill him 20 times, then I'll, you know, then no problem. We'll just make the ban permanent forever. And so, <laughs> so they're invading CBA to try to kill this dude, both to bring anime back and to ban it forever, depending on which side is, is leading the particular op. And Yin loves anime, so he is sort of leading the pro-anime crowd to fight back. It's ridiculous and awesome at the same time. 
The rally says, have there really been any fights yet in that war? Because from what I've seen, it's only propaganda so far. They have engaged in fighting. It's not like hundreds of billions of super caps fighting, but it's definitely happening. Um, they've attacked them in low second minimum. And I think they've hit some citadels. Uh, Lucky Ace says they're invading CVA to get the faction citadels once outposts switch. The anime thing is mostly RP. Could be. I predict a lot of wars about trying to get those faction outposts because they're going to be incredibly valuable property. I think you're going to see a lot of alliances try to push their borders and people pushing back and people trying to sneak systems from alliances that are overextended just to try to get that shit because they're going to be incredibly valuable. It's basically like an alliance tournament ship, but for a station. And yeah, uh, Providence essentially has an outpost every system. I think there may be a handful that don't. Uh, but they've invested very heavily in making sure that their otherwise broke-ass region had excellent infrastructure. So neutrals come in and then they largely tax the activity that happens in the stations. Which means they're making good enough money, even though they don't actually have that many valuable moons compared to other regions. Pretty smart. Of course, I know from experience that the actual configuration of said stations leaves a lot to be desired, but maybe they've fixed that over the years. <laughs> I was aghast at the tax rates and permission restrictions when we took over some of the Providence stations. I was like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> no wonder you're broke. Oh, uh, Mercenary Coalition. I haven't, I haven't mentioned that. Uh, they were hired against Goon Swarm in the World War B affair there. I was part of them at the time. They were basically one of the first alliances to start fighting us and some of the low-sec residents in the area. And after the war... They got a constellation and essentially a long-term friendliness with NC Dot. So they're not really part of the NC Dot PL block, um, but they do have a lot of friendly relationships with both the lot both alliances, and they'll frequently take contracts for them. But uh, despite the small footprint, MC is a pretty decent PvP alliance, and not as good as they could be in my vain opinion. Um, but they're pretty good, and they're they're getting better all the time. They've picked up some really nice corps recently, which have buffed their numbers and PvP capabilities. So even though they're a tiny, tiny dot on the map, they're definitely a power. I'd put them like on the same level as Try down in the south, but they're less. They're, they're more neutral than Try. Try is can be somewhat proactive in terms of fighting. Like, they invaded the stain wagon area to help install Test and Circle 2 up in here. Likewise with FCON. Um, whereas in MC rarely gets itself involved in conflicts unless they're bought in on one side or another. Otherwise, they just kind of chill out and roam around. Oh, I know. I know Tri is in a small alliance, but MC probably puts out as much output as Tri does in terms of numbers and stuff. I mean, I, it's been a while since I've seen Try really throw down, but if they didn't call in other allies, I think they're probably roughly MC equivalent, maybe a little bit bigger. I could be way off on that, but... Lucky says, that's why you want to go red to Pravi, pick a blingy target, and go red on it. A couple bill is worth way more than you would make in Pravi. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there you have it. Oh, thanks for the host, Eve Zone. Nine viewers, wow. Thanks, man. I think that's the biggest host I've ever had.
It'll be very interesting to see. But yeah, I I predict Volt is probably going to get evicted from Quirius before the end of the year. I would be shocked if they still have the space that they have by January. Jesus! Hey, thanks for the follow. What's up, Malicite? Um, gangbang team, Goonstorm... Uh, I don't know. Depends on what's going on with Test and Circle of Two. But if we're talking purely the push for faction outposts, which come out uh, probably January-ish, uh, I'm going to guess Goon Swarm, if they're not embroiled in a conflict with Test and Circle of Two, is probably going to go get some. Like, it's basically free money up here if they want it. I don't think gangbagging culture could really stop them. Um, but we'll see. As for other stuff, some of these alliances here, like, uh, I don't know what you would call this, like the... <laughs> basically the, uh, the Balkans of the South. Some of those alliances are probably going to get pushed out if they have outposts by larger groups that just want to have more faction outposts. Whether they come back or not, who knows. And that's probably going to be it in terms of major shakeups. Malicite says, I know Immensi is having a hard time with lots of PL presence since FanFest. I haven't heard about this story, Malicite. Clue us in. What's going on in Immensi? Immensi is... be in here somewhere. Ah, there it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Zerelli says, this stream is a primer for your new crew and the geopolitical climate on EVE before you throw them in as a meat shield? Exactly. <laughs> I gotta go, hey guys, we're gonna, gonna go invade so-and-so, you know. I should have some idea. <laughs> Seriously, though, I mean, that, that faction outpost push, that could be fun. Even if you're not successful, it's gonna be a lot of good fighting. So maybe that's something we do at the end of the year. I don't know. Not ruling it out, certainly. Depends on how many dudes we have at the time. Speaking of which... You're open for recruitment if anyone in the chat wants to hop on board. <laughs> Vague promises of content. Uh, Malicite says, PL and Goons have just been hitting stuff in Immensi. The other day, FCON or ICON lost an Asbel to PL. It was on Reddit. Hmm. Is that the worst? I mean... One Asbel. Not too bad. PL's definitely probably bored up there, though. They don't want to start shit with X, Death, and Solar, but they're friends with everybody to the left of them. So, if you can't go left, and you can't go right, gotta go south. <laughs> I imagine they'll probably get more serious about taking systems toward the end of the year. That'd be my guess. It won't take them long to do. Like it only takes a week to take an outpost, and they can take several at the time, especially against the alliances of this size. So, in actuality, you know, uh, maybe a month's lead time to take everything. So maybe a Christmas war, or just shy of Christmas. There's usually a winter war in Eve, generally speaking. Um, even the summer is m usually more quiet as people are enjoying the outside or going on vacation places. And then once the fall starts to hit, there's usually a war in October-ish and then a, a bigger war December, January, February, somewhere in there. Uh, that was when World War B happened. I'm sure there's going to be a big fuck-off war again this year. Who knows how big, yeah, who yeah. knows where, but... It's like, it's like Ramadan. <laughs> Allah! Uh, speaking of suicide ganking. Scary, uh, Malicite's going on. Says the scariest thing is that FCON had a fleet but didn't attempt to contest. Not that they'd win versus PL, but still. 
Yeah, you can't be mad at him for that. FCON has shown that they're willing to fight. Whatever else you might say about them, they are shit. <laughs> they're they're probably one of the worst household name currently holding Nullsec type alliances. I'll say that. But they're not cowards. They will show up. They're not risk averse. They put up a pretty good fight all on their own to defend their space in World War B. They got help from nobody, basically. And they still turned up in numbers. So I'm not going to throw them under the bus for not taking a particular fight, especially against Pandemic Legion. Yeah, there's no reason to throw your fleet away like that. Uh, Zerelli says, join today. You might be a famous corpse tomorrow. <laughs> Hey, Cassidy Sky, welcome to the stream. Malicite asks, has there ever been a summer war? Ah, I I gotta believe there has been. I can't really name one. The most famous wars are usually in the fall and the winter. Uh, maybe the Pendulum War way back? I forget when exactly that took place, but there was basically a big superpower in Delve period basis Quirius, and a big su superpower in Esoteria, Paragon Soul, Omst, Faith Abilis, that whole area. And the group on the left went right and took almost their, everything over, and then they got pushed back into the middle, and then the group from the right went all the way over to the left. Uh, like a pendulum. That's how it got the name. That was crazy as shit. Good stuff. And you can read all about that in the uh, in the Empires of Eve book, which I strongly recommend. AAA earned that title. No need to give it away. AAA doesn't have any space. Of course, we all know AAA is shit, so if they had space, then certainly. <laughs> but they don't. That's a, uh, for the new guys, that's a long-running meme. The AAA is shit. Occasionally they're not shit. Uh, they are occasionally the leaders of Stainwagon and one of the most powerful PvP alliances in the South. But even at that point, they're still shit. Mr. Shiny is out. Later, dude. Enjoy dinner. Any other questions about EVE politics or EVE's Geographical layout. Got Arbitrary Old Man. Uh, says, I haven't played you in a while. Remember, you used to lead Noir. What caused you to swap away? A combination of my work schedule and my dissatisfaction with life and mercenary coalition. I just didn't fit that culture. And with the limited time I had to play, you know, the, the interactions that I was having when I was hopping on Eve were not positive and it was really causing me to not play the game that much and Noir wanted to keep doing the MC thing I really didn't at the time so it was a good opportunity to hang it up after nearly a decade of leading the corp and give it to a successor who can you know take it into the next the next phase of the corp's development now that it's a established big corp and so I did a little soul searching. I joined NC Dot for a bit, uh, specifically Evolution. Great guys, but unfortunately they're great guys that did not play in my time zone at all. So I wound up by myself most of the time. And so I decided to start my own thing up, and that's when I started up the Capitalist Army. And we've been uh, growing pretty steadily. Pretty happy with the direction things are going. You can always use more dudes, but that's true even of Noir. You <laughs> can always use more dudes in your fleet. Uh, but I'm pretty happy with the people that we've recruited. So it's, uh, it's been a great experience. He really says, uh, the past wars used to take longer to ramp up. So some of them were started in the summer, but they all had low activity during the summer stage and then really kicked off in the autumn. That is also true. There have been some big fuck-off fights in the summertime, but it's n not the cosmic map-shaking level stuff. This doesn't tend to happen in that time frame.
Got a lot of folks watching. 22. Holy shizzle. Yeah, man. <laughs> oh, we got Eve Prosper on as well. A uh, really great dude, Eve Prosper. Very smart about the markets. If anyone is interested in that kind of stuff, highly recommend it. In fact, maybe we'll host him after uh, after the stream is over. Uh, speaking of, uh, last call for questions. What's up, Drezd? Welcome to the stream. I might start the stream up again in a little bit. Uh, potentially breakfast club happening tonight. We're not sure yet. Um, in fact, I should probably text Delator right now to see if they're going to form up for breakfast club. If they are, I'm going to try to stream it. Let's see. DC, Bay Bay. For those of you who are not in the know, Breakfast Club is a uh, fantastic room that we do with Noir. Um, it's basically Noir's weekly op, and then Capitalist Army will come on it too, because I'm invited. Um, it's pretty great. It's it's usually we're in something like a retribution fleet, or some kind of weird concept fleet, or we're in remote rip battleships, which is in itself kind of a weird fleet. <laughs> But it's, it's like unusual fleets run by very skilled people, usually trying to take on stuff that's too big for our britches and get some dank kills. Um, it's a good time, and it's great to fly with the NAR guys. I love it. Mr. Turnal says, what happened here? What is the map for? I've just been doing an explanation for new players about you know, what's where and you know why certain parts of the map are the way they are and how politics kind of works in the game, which alliances are the big powerhouses, that kind of stuff. Can you turn the light on? Thank you. Let's see, Drezd asks, how do you think the new moon mining is going to affect the dynamic of large and small alliances? That's a great question. And I have no fucking idea. <laughs> there are so many variables with this. It is, uh, man, it's really difficult to predict how this is going to shake out. Like, I, I honestly don't know. Um, if you're not familiar with the changes, guys, basically moons, the way they work now, you set up a POS, you tell it to mine this moon, and then you come back a week later, and your hangar is full of moon stuff that you can go sell or use to turn into other things. It's very valuable. These zero zero alliances have tons of these very valuable moons all over their space, and there's some in low sec as well. Usually controlled by a, a null power or one of the low sec crews that's a rival of a null power. However, now they're changing it such that you have to basically do a mining op to get the value out of those moons. It's not just going to come out automatically anymore. I think for small alliances, this is really going to hurt them in that they're not going to get as much out of the moons that they can manage to hold. But I think it's going to make it more difficult for the large guys to hold as many moons at once. So you're probably going to see more balkanization of the moons. Jesus! Thank you for the follow. And I... It's hard to... Because I don't know what the numbers are going to be. Like... If the numbers are exactly equal right now, I think you're going to see crazy price, uh, nah, price fluctuations as there's no way that our current NullSec population is going to be able to keep up with the output having to manually mine each of the moons that they would be if the goo just got pumped out normally, which means there's going to be big supply shortages, which means there's going to be big price hikes because supply is going to go down demand is still going to be even. And that may be a conflict driver in that if an alliance doesn't have as many moons as they can realistically you know, mine, they have a big incentive to go take some more. Ha however, <laughs> and, I, and I see your comment, Drez, about, uh, about rental empires, but I think even renting, they're still not going to have enough 
there might be some high sec folks that come out for it, but I, I just have a hard time imagining that there's going to be enough to meet the demand. I mean, there are a lot of moons. I mean, a lot of moons. And there's already big efforts to get high sec people to move from high sec to null sec. They're just not coming out in the numbers. I don't necessarily think this change will drive enough people out there to meet the demand. If there even are enough people, this could be a change that sort of future-proofs the game in that it's there's not enough folks to keep up with the demand right now, but if the population were to grow in the future, maybe that would change. The other side of it is, if you're able to mine a huge amount of the moon mineral, as opposed to... Um, you know, the current amounts, that could be a little different. Maybe that's a balance thing, so the price thing isn't that sharp, and the market's more or less stabilized, but you have this healthier dynamic of how to collect the resources. It's hard to say. It could go, could go either way. Uh, it could be that you get less, and it's just more valuable each nugget. Mr. Turtle says, Alec, is the Alliance Bob still around? No. <laughs> Bob's been gone since uh, 2009? 10? I want to say 9. What's up, Tracy? Um, the, some of the corps in Bob are still active in the NC. Pandemic Legion block. Uh, Northern Coalition is like half of old Bob. <laughs> Uh, Drez says, also, there is going to be a push for Outpost and Eve. Yes, I 1,000% agree with that one. I think that's going to be a hundred, like a guaranteed thing. You're going to see multiple wars in different parts of the map of large alliances pushing for more of these outposts and for opportunistic smaller alliances to pick off outposts from alliances that are currently overstretched. That's the dynamic that I see happening between now and the end of the year. I'm good, Tracy. Uh, Turtle says, I see Goomstorm still kicking. Yep. They lost World War B, but you really wouldn't know it. They went from the north to the south, but they lost... I mean, they lost their stations, their infrastructure up here, but they lost none of their fleet, none of their PvP power. They lost a lot of allies, but none of their core members or very few of them anyway so they're they're still extremely strong and you know they've lost like the fcons and guys like that but they've gained red alliance who they're not paired with so they have probably come out slightly worse on the other end of it but not nearly as much as you would think considering the stake and scale of what they lost Cortex Burn says the anime war is just a front to get ready for the outpost change. It's very possible. Very possible. It is a bit early. That's the only reason why I'm slightly skeptical of that. Because the outpost change isn't going to happen until January at the earliest. So, you know, I mean, you're, you're making a push to hold these things for six months. You know, I, I get that they're in the pandemic block, so if they take it, they're unlikely to lose it. But still, that's pretty bold. Uh, Drez says, what group do you fly with? I have an, a, my own corporation called the Capitalist Army. We're in the New Eden Trading Company Alliance, which isn't, is, I guess, loosely affiliated with NC.PL and the Russian blocks. Basically, everybody except goons. <laughs> uh, but in practice, we're not really blue or red with anyone. We're fairly neutral. I fly with Noir more than any other external group. Uh, Cortex Prince said it earlier, I highly doubt that Reza is dumb enough to start a war for those outposts this early, just like Alex said. I mean, I, I think he would definitely start a war for them. I just question the timing. It could be just a fun thing that they're doing 
without any larger strategic goal. That's not outside the realm of possibilities. Really says if you're gonna start the war early, at least wait until after the summer. Yeah, like um, early October-ish, you might see some some movement, but I don't think things are gonna really kick off till after Thanksgiving. Possibly even until after Christmas, to be honest, just because the holidays are the holidays. There are some people that have more time to play in the holidays than not, but those people tend not to be the alliance leaders and the FCs, which both of which you kind of need to drive these sorts of conflicts. You might see sort of what's really talked about, where something kicks off and there's some PvP happening, but not really a big territory push. It's just sort of a warm-up phase. That could definitely be. Mr. Turtle says, what is the most current war going on? That would be the anime war. Uh, there's the anime war, and then there's the fights between Goonswarm, Test Circle of Two, and apparently Pandemic Legion is fighting in Immensia with the groups down there. Those are the three main conflicts that are happening right now. Otherwise, the map is pretty quiet. Cortex what? says the anime war provides a reason to a reason to mass resources on the Pravi doorstep. Nobody questions asset movements then. That's true. That is, of course, ascribing a level of deviousness to pandemic horde. That's pretty hard to maintain. Those guys are not exactly the Guiding Hand Social Club. <laughs> they are uh, disorganized, overzealous newbies headed up by jaded bitter vets who got unjaded by being in close proximity to said newbies. So they're not like... Maybe they are, but I don't know. That seems like a very jaded, kind of calculated political move that I don't... Yeah. I'm not going to say you're you're totally wrong, Cortex. I think you have a very interesting idea, but I think it's less likely than it is likely. Let me put it like that. Let's see, Mr. Turtle, you got the Reddit vs. Common Sense war that's always going on. That's true. Uh, Cortex says, is Tri still perking, poking at Guardians of the Galaxy? Nah, no, I don't think so. Uh, I don't even think Guardians of the Galaxy is a current coalition anymore. I could be wrong, but I, I think they've renamed or reformed... Um, into something else. It's hard to keep up with the politics of the South, especially in this this Balkans area where there's lots of these small groups that have very shifting allegiances. Turtle says, have you ever blown up anyone from Pandemic Horde? Many times. They were uh, good roaming targets for a while. Enjoyed them very, very much. <laughs> They're fun to fight, because they're, you know, they're... Oh, Guardians of the Galaxy is darkness up in the north, and I, I definitely don't think it's happening anymore. Uh, let's see. Pandemic Horde. Yeah, they're great. Um, you know, you can send small numbers in there. They will form up to fight you, but they're not, like, pro enough that if they're outnumbering you two or three to one, you can't engage them. So it's, it's kind of a fun, it's more or less a fair fight against uneven odds, which is a pretty enjoyable place to be for PvPers like me. Uh, Turtle says, I bet they do not like you then. No, I think they love me. To the extent that they know me at all. Um, one of my former XOs is a leader in the Alliance, Nitty Masters. I got a lot of folks that listen to the show in Pandemic Horde. They're fans of the show. Um, they love the Pandemic Phone parody that I wrote and Jim Lin's song. So PL and, and Pandemic Horde get a big kick out of that one. So they just certainly don't hate me for any reason. It's all in good fun. They probably had as much fun fighting me as I did fighting them. It's not like we providence them or we kick them out of their space. Um tell me uh tell me about how you uh a someone can overextend themselves 
I, I would think that if you own the that if you own the system, you own the modes, you own the you own the stuff that it's just that you just own it and you just defend it. How how do you then get overextended? Like like why why would you break off more than you could chew in the first place? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um so you can always be overextended in Eve. It's been easier to do more recently, but the idea is that your holdings are so far end to end that it's difficult for you to get your capital assets from one end to the other to defend it. So if you're if you look on my map here, if you're say in Delve over here, but you also expand into Paragon Soul, it's very you only have the one super capital fleet. Like it would be enormously, probably prohibitively expensive for you to double it. Like just as a matter of course. So being able to get those pilots and ships from this end of Paragon Soul all the way over here to this end of Delve is a pretty difficult undertaking. So in, in practice, alliances have to be very careful about you know how far they extend themselves. Now, the game has also changed such that the sovereignty system gives the defender benefits if, the, if they are active in the space, doing stuff like mining, ratting, etc. So if you are actually living in a system and you know it's it's got all the hallmarks of your daily life happening in there you're going to be i think it's three times more difficult to overtake than if it's unoccupied essentially so someone attacking a relatively unoccupied system is going to be able to conquer it way faster so if you're counting on on these high defensive timers to make your defense strategy viable which most of these groups are you get, are you very strongly incentivized to make sure that you're focusing your efforts on a small number of systems that you can reasonably populate and have pretty consistent capital coverage in such that you could respond to an attack is there is there any unpopulated uh, space in 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 the Gao Kingdom? oh tons 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 um for instance, over here in Cloud Ring, this initiative space, depending on the time of day you go there, you might never see another player. Maybe you'll see one. I'm sure it's populated at certain times of the day, but not really populated in others. Likewise, this Russian space over here, they may be active in Russian time, but when the Russians go to sleep, it's like a ghost town. There might as well be no one there at all. There are some systems which are controlled by large blocks, like Test, Circle of Two. Uh, I would imagine Goonswarm is in that, certainly the Shadow of Death, where, yes, they have large numbers of these systems, but in practice, no one really is there. They're just there as a buffer, or there because an important moon is there, and they want to be able to control the station, but no one actually is like living there. So, a lot of these systems actually have pretty low activity indicators, which, I, like I said, sort of reflect on the ability to attack or defend the system. But, uh, of course, the practical matter of going, oh, no one lives there, I'll just go attack it. You know, you're sort of pushing in on these larger groups' sphere of influence, and they will absolutely project power to make sure that they have control. It'd be like, oh, I, I don't know, like Cuba, for instance, you know. Jesus! Can't have uh, Russia put, <laughs> putting missiles in Cuba, or the U.S. will have some problems with it. Same concept. You know, you want to, you maybe don't want to completely control and oversaturate any given area, but you have very good understanding of what areas are important to you, and you don't want to have an host a potentially hostile group establish a foothold somewhere near you that could be a problem later, like as a launching pad for invasion from some other group or someone that roams your space constantly. Um, so there are, there's definitely an incentive for groups, even if they don't actually control a system, to still project power to it if they don't like the look of anyone that's in that area. Getting caught up with the chat here. Uh, if they say, uh, Turtle is trying, or Zarelli is trying to convince Turtle to go PvP. 
Uh, Malice Sites says, isn't the stuff getting taken over by Pandemic Horde and Cloud Ring? I cannot confirm that. Uh, Pandemic Horde is really, I think, focused on the anime war down in Catch. Uh, there's not a huge powerhouse to stop them from taking stuff in Cloud Ring, so... Fuck it, sure. You know, there wouldn't be a lot to stop them if they wanted to, but I don't think that's their main focus right now. Thank you for the follow, Zadalus Rising! Uh, Turtle is running missions and he's enjoying himself considerably. Zarelli is trying to talk him into low sec for level 5s. Quite profitable from what I hear, although I've never tried them myself. Oh, for the uh, overextension thing, there's also... An, uh, supply lines um but that's it's it's an interesting supply lines are rarely an issue in terms of like getting things from one place to another there are certain parts of the game like the drone regions which are a big pain in the ass uh, but for the most part if you want to go get a ship you can get a ship if your alliance needs ships you can send freighters to Jita and buy a whole bunch and get them where you need to go. The issue is not the the ships themselves, it's the quantity. If you are going through ships that are hard to produce at a higher rate, you may find yourself short of them. And uh, you know, generally speaking, where you live, you've got excess ships because you're just accumulating these fuckers. But if you're deploying somewhere or you're facing an invasion in some place that's too far away from your ship cache and you don't have the bandwidth to move it all, at least enough of it to keep fighting, that can also be a problem. It's, it's much rarer that that is an issue. But sometimes you'll see like alliances that use very special ships for their doctrines, like a uh, Macarial is a good example. Macarials are faction ships. There's been a change to allow them to drop more frequently, which brought the cost down. Which brought it in the range that these Nelsec alliances could afford to stock their fleets with them, so they became the main ship, because they're stat-wise super good. But they are a faction ship, which means there's a pretty limited quantity of them. It's not like Tech 1, where you can just produce as many as you want, and everyone in Nels and Eve can produce as many as they want. There's a fixed drop rate. So during the course of World War B, I'm pretty sure it was the Mac. It might have been the Nightmare, but I'm almost positive it was the Mac. There was actually so much fighting with both sides using Macarials that Jita actually ran out. <laughs> there were literally not enough Macarials to replace a fleet. And so that forced some of the groups involved to change to different kinds of ships. So the supply lines in that way got cut, but that was more an exhaustion of demand than any, like... Uh, active interdiction action by a hostile power. Uh, in practice, that's very difficult to do. It used to be that wars were the thing that you did for that, Empire Wars. So you could attack a shipment of, say, Macarials on its way from Jita to wherever the fighting was. But nowadays, uh, you know, alts are so common in the game that any alliance of, of relative seriousness does all their important shipping on alternate accounts that are not war deckable or they're so small that it's unlikely that they're going to be decked. So you can war deck, say, a Shadow of X death all you want, but you're never really going to catch a freighter that's under that name going from A to B because that's just not how they do things. It's all through shell corporations and characters. There's also, uh, which I didn't cover, but like physically interdicting the players themselves. This doesn't happen too often, but can happen. It was something Noir was involved with in the AAA invasion of Providence. It happened during the BTAC R fight, which was a huge, uh, like infamous situation where both sides thought they had the advantage in capital ships, and both sides put their super capitals on the field 
And the result was like a huge bloodbath. That's one of the most expensive in terms of overall Isk lost fights that Eva's ever seen. The fight was so long that pilots that died were able to go back to the regions that they had ships in and move them all the way the fuck out there, come back in for another round. One of the tactics was, you know, groups would figure out what the important midpoints were between uh, the battlefield and where the people were resupplying from, and they would drop interdiction bubbles on top of capital ships so they couldn't make the jump. They would position, excuse me, small fleets of ships on the gates so people couldn't make the trip in the subcaps, and they would prevent these reinforcements from actually making it to the battlefield. Uh, so that is definitely a thing that happens, but that's very in the moment, and it really is only an issue if there's a huge protracted engagement in one place, such that people throw caution to the wind, and they're just trying to get as many ships there as fast as possible, and they're not scouting properly, they're not you know, using jump freighters and other safe logistics to deploy them, because they need to get their pilots there now. And when they're rushing, they're making mistakes. And those are mistakes that you can capitalize on to to basically interdict supply lines in that way. It's like a, a human supply line. That pretty much answer your question. Yes. Sweet. Got thirty viewers in the stream. Holy cow. Yeah, man. Doing it. What's up, everybody? Thank you for oh, Cassidy Sky with the penultimate question. How does this all relate to ponies? Well, if you were at my elite seminar for how My Little Pony makes you fucking awesome at Eve, uh, you would know the importance of friendship in a lot of these relationships. Uh, not everything is determined by geopolitics. Like I said, like Goon Swarm and Red Alliance, for instance, have forged this long-term friendship. Uh, likewise, Shadow of X-Death and Legion of X-Death, the leader of that crew, his name is Death. Um... He is like the one of the two or three, I'd say one of the two, really, like penultimate leaders of the Russian blocks. It's him and Master, a.k.a. Maktep. And between the two of them, they basically run the Russian blocks. Um, and, you know, other figures have come into prominence as well, but those two are like the, the ones that have really tended to last throughout the years. And Death, in particular, is very good at politics. He has been elected to the CSM every time that he's ran, as far as I know. And uh, being on the CSM, he's able to forge relationships with folks in Pandemic Legion leadership, Goon Swarm leadership, etc., to the point that no one really wants to fuck with him. So he's got space that nobody wants, and he's like, no one really wants to punch him for being an asshole. They all just kind of like hanging out and drinking with him. And like I said, no one wants to invade the space for economic reasons. As a result, he's pretty much safe. <laughs> like, anyone that could possibly threaten his holdings is very friendly with him. And there's there's no real reason for anyone to, to throw that friendship under the bus. Uh, likewise, NC Dot and PL, just a great cultural friendship that's evolved over the course of them having worked together and met at FanFest a whole bunch of times and things like that. Like, And for a while, there was not even hostility between Goonswarm, PL, and NC Dot. Prior to World War B, they were really good friends. Um, they're just a lot of cultural cross-pollination at EVE events and the CSM. Just you know, Everybody's hanging out in the same chat channels. Nobody really wants to ruin the game for the other person, so they might fight for fun, but never really to inconvenience the other. Things change during World War B. But even now, like they're not they're not running from the north to go chase these guys down south. There's no 
bitterness there. You know, they're, they're friends outside the game. And that small club of elites, it's, I guess you would call it like the old boys club of Eve, that's where a lot of shit gets decided. Um, who's invading who, who gets what space, you know, which FCs are in versus which FCs are out in terms of EVE social framework. A lot of that shit is decided by groups of, like, less than 50 people, to be honest. Some of it, like, groups of less than 20 people. And you would be surprised at the level of decisions these guys make that really affect your game, even if you're like Turtle and you just hang in high sec and you're not involved in the 0-0 zero zero game at all. The kinds of backdoor deals and relationships these folks form impact the entire universe. Drez said, that makes it sound dull. If all the large blocks are friends, where is the conflict? Well, sometimes that's an issue. Um, prior to the change that made Nullsec easier or harder to defend and take, depending on the activity level of the system, there was not much conflict. Um, there were certain blocks which weren't part of this social circle, and they fought each other. But the real movers and shakers, NC Dot, Pandemic Legion, the Russians, and Goon Swarm, were all on the same page. They were roughly equal in strength, and no one wanted to move against the other. And they were fine just dividing the moons up. Even at one point, there was an actual peace treaty uh, we called the Bot. I think it was called the Bot Accords or something like that, where they agreed on like moon sharing rights and, and price setting and all this stuff. That has broken down with the advent of the uh, activity-based SOV system. A lot of the alliances involved had to shrink their holdings, which made room for new groups to come in, which brought a little bit of instability. Um, certain groups plan for it better than others. Goon Swarm, I think, probably did the best planning of any Nelsec group in prep for that change. But they still wound up fucking up because one of the richest people in the game got insulted by one of their satellite members. And much like Volt and uh, CVA, CVA, or in this case, Goon Swarm, wound up paying the price because that rich dude talked to his two other richest friends. The three of them were like, I think the three of the five most richest people in the game. And they literally threw money at alliances until they were like, oh yeah, let's, let's fucking do this. And they personally funded one third of the game to go to war against the other third of the game. And that was World War B. <laughs> they paid MC to go in. They supported all the low sec alliances going in. They supported, I think, culture uh, going in. Uh, they supported it. They paid for PL. NC Dot came in for it. They financed Mordu's Angels. You know, there was all this shit going on, basically just throwing money at Goonswarm, and Goonswarm could not keep up. Um, and that totally reset the map, and as a result of that conflict, you had new rivalries form, where Test, who used to be sort of on Goonswarm's side, and then had a bit of a falling out, and they became friends again, now they're definitely on the outs. Circle of Two stabbed goons in the back, basically abandoned them, although they would argue that they got abandoned first. But those two can't stand each other anymore. So there's new conflict being formed, but it's it's just a byproduct of the game. You spend enough time around people that you play online with, and you get to meet up with them at FanFest, or meet up with them on the CSM. You just can't help but but leave a lot of those EVE conflicts in the background when you're hanging out drinking beers at a bar. Um, so it's it's just kind of a natural thing that, that seems to happen. But there are groups there that, are are groups involved, that are not involved. Like, um, unless unless yeah. you're drinking gin, then you're fucking throwing punches. <laughs> well, that has happened too. <laughs> One dude, I think it was like hitting on another alliance leader's girlfriend and there was a physical fight at FanFest that resulted in an invasion shortly thereafter. <laughs> <laughs> fucking perfect, man. That's, That's exactly. generally speaking the exception rather than Don't the rule. Touch my girl, I'll fuck you up. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty much. Yeah, I think uh, the dude that threw the punch wound up losing Fountain over it. I think. 
Uh, Lost Fountain or Lost Esoteria Paragon Souls? One of the two. I don't remember where the map was at back then. Uh, Turtle says, who is friends with who on this map other than Goons and Red Alliance? So you've got Goons and Red Alliance, they're bros. Um, they're also bros with Initiative and Dream Fleet. They're all friends. Uh, Stain Wagon is also friends with Red, although they don't have space at the moment. You've got CVA, who's friends with these guys up here. you got Test and Circle of Two here, and Brave. They're like a, a big block together. And they're, I believe, friends with Wings and Band of Backstabbers and possibly Army of New Eden. Not sure about Requiem Eternal, but I would guess so. Either they're friends with them or they're neutral, but they're not really hostile. Just kind of like both live in there. I'm not sure what Requiem's political status is at the moment. Then you got Solar, or excuse me, then you got FCON. And they're with Kids with Guns, uh, and a lot of these guys up in this in this band right here, including Dr uh, I think Drone Walkers is with Circle of Test, the Brave Circle of Test. Then you got Try, who leads this bunch up in here. Uh, Requiem is with Test and Brave. I'm being told by Athleted in the chat. Okay. And then you got Solar kind of on their own, I think. Uh, they might have some smaller alliances helping them out, but Solar is essentially allies with X-Death. That's basically one big block. So Hell's Pirates, Cohortus Trilari, Brothers of Tangra, which isn't really a PvP alliance. It's just NPC farmers uh, in Panic. All these guys are one big group. And these guys are also friendly with this group, although they're not big powerhouses. In fact, Everybody Lies is Pretty push overable. I've taken a look at their space and considered it, believe me. Um, but they're friends with X Death, who will definitely, you know, come back them up. Then you got PL, NC Dot, and Pandemic Horde. They're very tight. Basically, it's called the Pan Fam, Pandemic Family. And there's also a group that doesn't have space on here called Waffles. They're also um, basically Pandemic Horde before Pandemic Horde was a thing. They're also in the Pan Fam. Mordus and Pure Blind Cartel, and I believe so, are friendly with each other. They're blue with all these other guys, but they're not really too friendly. You got Darkness, which is Chaos Theory and Solaris. Like these guys up here. Then there's the Branch Dudes, Methodical, Blades, Out of Sight, Lumpy. And that's. Oh, and then uh, over here you've got the Culture, Gang Bang, and System Wide. A swarm, basically a swarm in pixels. They're all one big group over here. In terms of friendliness, uh, goons are friendly with death. And test is friendly with only the people in their block and somewhat pandemic legion and NC dot. NC dot is friendly with death. Death is friendly with everybody. Uh, CVA is friendly with no one currently. FCON is Sort of friendly with goons, but there's no real practical coordination happening. And they're friendly with Try. Friendly-ish. I don't think Try really loves them that much, but the, they are what they are. Um, I think Try sees them as like free repeat meals they can get fed on. Oh, uh, I'm being told Hell's, Pir Hell's Pirates flies with Try, not Solar. My bad. So Hell's Pirates is in the Tries block, not the Russian block. My bad. Um, not familiar with some of the new alliances down in that corner, so I appreciate the help chat. Let's see. You're really saying, check out the Scalding Pass of Mency Wicked Creek area. All those small alliances were unable to hold Sov until the changes. Because there's a ton more smaller conflicts now instead of the north versus south or east versus west that you had. That's extremely true. Uh, Drez is in a power block. I'm guessing goons. Unclear. Uh, let's see. Athlated says, Requiem's Death Brave. We saw that. Um, Athlated flies with Requiem. How come we always get PL down there? Because the fucking uh, Test and Brave are always down there. Like, of course, Pandemic Legion is going to invade. That's where all the fun fights are. 
Test and Brave are like guaranteed good times. Test Brave and Pandemic Horde. Wherever those guys are at, you can know you can go get some content from them. And Pandemic Legion is always going to follow that content. Drez, I thought PL was farming Pandemic Horde for a while. That was like for a hot two weeks, maybe. It wasn't a big deal. It was bigger on Reddit than it was in the actual game. Brave uh, lost five Titans because uh, they were stupid enough to drop against PL. <laughs> Dress said, I'm not in Goons. That's an insult. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, <laughs> didn't mean to throw you under the bus, Dress. I don't think being in Goons is that much of an insult. The, the Goons are okay, you know. I've, I've met enough of them to, to have a healthy respect for the Goon. You know, they're scammy edge lords, but you know they're also well organized and generally decent Eve players. The really says, Drez, I'm guessing you're mixing up PL farming brave. That's an ongoing thing for everyone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think Brave did something super smart where they only concentrated themselves in this tiny, tiny patch of systems here in Catch. They could easily have taken a whole region, like Circle of Two, maybe even two regions like Test. That's what they would have done under the old system for sure, but no, they said we're deliberately not doing that. We want to take this small patch of space, we're going to stick our dudes in it, and we're going to farm the crap out of it. we got great allies, our space is going to be rock solid, all of our dudes are together. They're maximizing their, they're really concentrating, maximizing their ability to defend that area. I think that's a great move. I worry for test. Like, I know Esoteria is relatively safe, and Paragon Soul is relatively safe from invasion because of the sheer gaps in geography involved. But, I mean, test was having a difficult time controlling half of Vale, so... I have no idea how they're going to keep two regions if they ever get under serious stress. Where's the Volta from? Uh, I think you mean Voltition Cult? Because actual Volta is a wormhole alliance, which is a whole other thing, Pete. There's the wormhole space groups, which are not on this map. There's 25,000 wormhole systems. They're not mapped anywhere except for like Eve Scout, which tries to map them a little bit. But they're constantly shifting because the wormholes collapse and reopen basically at random. Um, and there are some really powerful groups in there, some of which can challenge these Nullsec guys in fights. Uh, Volta is one of them, Hard Knox is another one. Um, you know, the politics of wormhole space is its whole other entity. It's less easy to visualize, obviously but definitely a thing, and some of them are extremely strong. They're very rich. Their means of staying rich are extremely well protected. None of these larger groups can really come into wormhole space and fuck with them because they're not as familiar with the mechanics, and the supplying into wormhole space is really fucking hard. So when these wormhole guys decide they want to come out into the, the established map, they can throw down with the best of them. Why doesn't that happen more often? Uh, it happens pretty often. Uh, let's say it's like a weekly or bi-weekly occurrence. It, it doesn't happen more often than that because they tend to fight amongst themselves and prefer to stay in wormhole space, doing wormhole space stuff, rather than come out into what they call K-space or known space. It's just... You know, they, they really measure themselves less against these Nullsec alliances than they do other groups in wormholes. So when they want to go for fights, not only do they want to stick with the mechanics that they like, but, you know, they want to trash their own rivals and kick out people there. So yeah, they really only come out into K-Space when there's a target of opportunity, like they get a zero zero connection and they put scouts out and happen to catch, like, a whole bunch of carriers doing something they shouldn't be doing. And then you'll see like them put capital ships and, and tech threes and stuff out through the wormhole to go fight the Nullsec guys. But there's really no sustained conflict possible because they don't want to leave their wormhole. 
and the K space guys don't want to go into that wormhole. Eve Zone asks, what happened with the Soviet Union in the South? Where are they? Uh, so they used to be Esoteria, Paragon Soul, and Faith Abolus. However, there was a war earlier this year. That's basically this year's January war. Was Circle of Two and Test invading in the South. And what wound up happening was CO2, Test, at least temporarily joined forces with Tri, FCON, and to a lesser extent, Solar Fleet. And to a lesser extent, Pravi, actually. Oh no, Pravi fought against. Uh, but they pushed against what was the Stain Wagon block in Ketch, Esoteria, Paragon, and Faith, and Tenerifus. And because of the overwhelming numbers, Stain decided to do what they normally do, which is pull up stakes, not really defend their space very seriously, conserve all their firepower, and move back into Stain. So Soviet Union, or what's left of them, is in Stain right now, basically biding their time, looking for an opportunity to push back out. Which they will do eventually when Tests or Circle of Two or any of the groups in Catch are perceived as too weak or politically isolated. Then you'll see Stain open its gates and basically the Russian orcs will pour forth and it's like cleanse the area retake their ancestral homeland, and then they'll wait for the next big temporarily temporarily allied block of alliances to come down and kick them out, at which point they'll go back to Stain, and the circle of life will continue. Let's see... <laughs> Zarelli says the N in Hard Knocks is silent. <laughs> Uh, Rybar80, welcome to the stream, says, Who holds the black holes on the map between alliances? Uh, so, there are a couple. Stain is Stain Wagon, which I, I just went over, so hopefully that answered your question there. Great Wildlands, yeah, I mean, control is like, air quotes. There's only three or four station systems in Great Wildlands, and they're all right next to each other. Most of Great Wildlands is blank, unused, worthless space that doesn't really lead anywhere important. All the activity is concentrated in like ten systems, and no one really important lives there. Sometimes you'll get like Mimitar role players or powerful folks in Molden Heath or Derelict. Uh, they will. Oh, there's also Curse, which I didn't cover. Curse is up in here. That's also an NPC region, which I left out. You can't really see it because it's kind of covered up by color, but it's like up in here. Uh, Curse is a is a pretty good spot. It's weird in that geographically it's not great to play in, but it's it's good roaming space out into sovereignty areas, and generally speaking, historically. It's been home to some really hardcore PvP alliances, so it has a reputation as a breeding ground for strong PV PvPers, even though geographically it doesn't really work too well for that. Um, I'm not sure who is in Curse right now, to be honest with you. Um, you've got Syndicate over here, which is currently being bullied out by NC Dot. I would say they effectively control the area. Um, there are a couple regular syndicate alliances which live there and have always lived there under one name or another and they're still in the area but I think as far as big powers essentially it's NC Dot at the moment uh, Outer Ring basically barren nobody lives there or would want to live there it's just a highway between um, Fountain and Cloud Ring the only interesting stuff in there is there are stations in Outer Ring, which are the only place that you can buy blueprints for mining ships. Like your Ventures, your Coveters, all those places, all the blueprints for that come from Outer Ring. So if you want to get said blueprints, you have to travel there. Um, but otherwise, there's very little reason to be there. A handful of valuable moons, but nothing really worth fighting over. Venal, not sure who lives in Venal at the moment. It's been very quiet, actually. Usually there's a war in it 
or someone in Venal is making war out into one of these other areas, but that's not really happening. Lumpy just defended a push, and ever since that, there hasn't really been much going on. And all the rest of this is low sec. Um, low sec or Empire Space which no one really controls. There are some big groups in the various areas, like there are big faction warfare groups in Black Rise and Placid. There are uh, Russian PvP alliances in the Forge. Uh, hopping around between all these regions, like up in here, this core group up in here, are alliances like Snuffbox, uh, Shadow Cartel, these huge PvP low sec alliances which are essentially the pandemic legions of low sec. They're the big fish. They rotate from hunting ground to hunting ground to hunting ground, eating capital ship fleets, eating battleship fleets, whatever they can get their hands on from the other groups, which can't really fight back against them. And once they overfish that one area, they'll rotate around. Um, usually there's a power group in Moldenheath, because it's sort of its own e ecosystem of low sec combat, but those guys aren't usually powerful in like the the scale of the rest of the game. They're just local powers. Um, what else is good? And there's usually a group in Solitude that influences Syndicate, uh, but I'm not sure who that group is right now. I haven't been over there in a while. I wish I could give you more. I'm sorry. <laughs> Eve's a big place. I can't be on, on top of it all the time. I used to know. But that information, I'm 100% certain, is out of date at this point. Uh, Tweak87 asks, how does an alliance choose a home? That is an awesome question. An alliance chooses a home based on a number of factors. Obviously, their own size. Um, their allies or friends, where the map is looking. And then, kind of, what's available. Um, you know, there's no point... Even if you really, 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 really want systems in Delve, if your alliance is a thousand people, there is no point to you trying to attack Goonswarm to take space. So that is not going to be a thing. If you want to get in with Goonswarm's group, then you have to do it diplomatically. Make a political alliance with them or an economic arrangement with them to get your alliance in. And usually it's some breakdown of where the alliance wants to be, what they perceive the value to be, whether their goal is to farm ISK or to get PvP, you know, if you want to farm ISK, you want a home that's isolated, that's far away from everyone else, difficult to get to, no one would really bother you there, certainly no sustained attack would be possible. But if you want PvP, if you don't want to just sit there and farm ISK, you want to interact with other players so you can fight them, then having an isolated system like that is the kiss of death because your players will get super bored really fast. So that's when you'd start looking at more like a, a catch or a, a tribute, a pure blind, something that probably borders low sec, where borders a very populated region. Like, uh, you know, if you're in catch, for instance, you could roam into Providence, very populated, tons of content all the time. If you're in Omst, for instance, you know you can roam into Faithableus, but probably you're blue with those guys because you're both after the same thing. Space where you can PvE and grind without being bothered. So why would you attack each other? Just blew up. Um, you know, those kinds of arrangements are definitely a thing. And there's a cultural element of it as well. If you're a Russian, you probably want to hang with other Russian players. If you're kind of, um, you know, into Reddit culture or, in, you know, just into forum internet culture in general, you'll probably want to be in Circle of Two or Tess, not your Circle of Two, but like Tess or Brave or Goonswarm, one of their groups. If you're into more traditional EVE elite PvP, you probably would gravitate more to NC. or PL, you know, um, if you want to be with newbie-friendly people, maybe you're looking at Horde, maybe you're looking at Brave. If you're German, maybe it's Lumpy. You know, generally you want to be with like-minded people uh, as, a, as a rule. So it's some combination of practical concerns. Where can you get in? Economic or cultural 
activity-based concerns, goal-based concerns. What are we trying to get out of this? Are we trying to get PvP? Are we trying to, you know, make money? What's what? And then the third element is like a cultural thing. You know, are we going to be around players that we like, players that we hate? If they're players that we hate, can we fight them off? Or is that even a viable thing? You know, it's those are, are questions you got to think about. And then, of course, you know, what group is going to have you? <laughs> uh, if you're an alliance like a Goonswarm or a Test, you can pick a region. Basically go, all right, well, the only people that can kill us, like, say, NC and PL, they're up in the north. So let's go as far the fuck away from them as possible. Let's go into the south. Because no one in the south can beat us. So we'll just go south and take over all that shit. Kick those guys out, fuck them. And we'll be fine. If you're not a big superpower like that, you really have to be strategic about where you can go and actually do something. If you're like a, I don't mean to pick on them, but like a Prothean alliance. You know, the Prothean alliance isn't going to go, uh, let's go take Outer Passage, because I've always wanted to be in the drone regions. You know, even if you ever, even if that were true and you did want to be in the drone regions, like there's literally no way that you're going to maintain residence taking something away from Solar Fleet, they're just not going to be okay with that. So you're not going to have it. It's it's just not going to be a thing. Um, but, you know, uh, maybe Base and Curse or Great Wildlands, and you start nibbling at some of these smaller alliances that are around here, and eventually you knock one or two of them off a peg, you sense blood in the water, and you start throwing down some roots earn the respect of the smaller alliances around you, maybe make an alliance or two. There you, there you go. All of a sudden you're in. You're okay. And maybe you get to the point where a Tri wants to partner up with you or an FCON wants to partner up with you uh, to secure their area. And that puts you in a more secure spot. So there are a lot of, of concerns like that which will go into it. Um, and then there's some like RP type concerns like Stain Wagon they have been in stain since the start of the game, since the beta, some of them. They do not want to move. This is their home. They have a strong emotional connection to that space and the space around it, which they see as rightfully theirs because they built a lot of the outposts that are there. They laid that groundwork that you know these invaders are currently using. You know, they feel like they're entitled to that area because they put the work in, because they were there first. And, you know, <laughs> these English-speaking fucks are going to get their asses kicked if they ever drop the ball. And they invariably do, and Stain comes out and retakes everything. That's just the way it is. Likewise with Providence. They were there since the beginning. They have role-playing reasons why this region is the important, most important region in the game. Even though monetarily it's not worth tons, uh, it's strategically it's not worth tons. But they believe that it is, and they've been there for forever. They've built every outpost there, except for Unity Station, which is in 9UI. That was built by the Mimitar role players, and then they promptly conquered it. <laughs> um, yeah, those they have a, a strong emotional attachment. Their entire alliance's reason for being is the protection of Providence, development of Providence, in the name of the Amar Empire. And if they're not doing that, they don't have a reason to exist. So their entire culture, organization, etc., is oriented around that. And they will never move. I think they're if they were to move to a different area, like they would cease to be. They basically dissolve. Uh, stop sign is a cool question. What is the smallest amount of space you can officially claim? Can you take an individual system, constellations, or does it have to be a whole region? You can take an individual system. In fact, you can take part of a system. You could own the system itself, but not the station in it, or vice versa. You could own the station, but not the official ownership of the whole system. So really only half a system, I think, is the smallest that you could claim. Um, effectively, most people go for a full system. 
The reason why it tends to be constellation based is because constellations are easy to defend, and in the Sov system, when you're sovereign. Jesus! Thank you. Oh wow, what a name. Bacon Dolphin. Fucking A, dude. Nice name. That's going in staff slack. <laughs> Thank you for the follow, man. Um, the reason why it's in constellations is if you are attacked and someone attacks your Sov, the nodes that spawn that you have to capture to retain control spread out through the whole constellation. So there's a pretty strong incentive for constellation control, if you can manage it, but it's not required. Uh, the reason why you see a lot of these alliances spread out for regions, or half of regions, is that the gaps between regions, uh, you can kind of see it here, look at these jumps down here, some of the gaps between the regions are extremely large. You can see it up in here as well. So if you control the region itself, it's much more difficult for someone to come from outside the region into your space. Jesus! Thank you, Esco. It's basically um, not impossible, certainly, but much more difficult. And if they do come in, you essentially know exactly where they're coming from, what the first points of battle are going to be, and then you can make sure that you heavily harden and plan to defend those areas. Um, so that's that's sort of how that works out. But you know, clearly not not required. You can see, mercenary coalitions only has one constellation up here. Uh, these guys, the Sarcos Federation, at least eyeballing it, looks like they maybe have two stations plus this system over here. Uh, or that system could be pure blind cartel or an entire another alliance. I have no fucking idea. Um, you don't need to take tons of space. You basically, you should take as much as you can hold. I think that's the good, good rule of thumb. If you can get away with controlling a region, it's definitely strategically beneficial that you do so. Um... But if you can't do it, you can't do it. And it's, like I said, not required in any way. Uh, Blood Covenant, for instance, is, is going to do just fine. <laughs> uh, Dirty Doodle says, Where is Intrepid Crossing? I am part of them. Just wondering where we're at. I don't think Intrepid Crossing has space anymore. Intrepid Crossing used to be up here in Ethereum Reach. Used to be the major power in Ethereum Reach. And then you guys got kicked out um, by the Russians in what I recall is a pretty epic war. I'm almost positive I have a, a a video saved in my hard drive documenting it with epic choral music and comms stuff and really glamorous shots of pos shooting. <laughs> but uh, I'm not much. I'm not really sure what became of you guys after that. I haven't really heard anything about Intrepid Crossing in a long time. Uh, Tweak87 says, what makes an alliance try and expand their territory? Also a good question. The main reasons are boredom. Uh, you know, you, you gotta do something to keep your PvPers engaged, so why not a convenient little war? <laughs> Sometimes it's economic. You feel like your alliance could do more with more moons is usually the reason, at least up to this point. And so you'll target another region that has lots of moons, maybe even a region entirely different than the one you're currently at, and you abandon your current space and move over there. Um, but generally you want to expand the amount of money that your alliance is going to be pulling in. Occasionally it's it's purely space. Like you could imagine... Let's, let's pick some dudes. Uh, Blood Covenant, for instance. We just talked about them. They're pretty small. Looks like they've got three stations and six systems. Now, if Blood Covenant all of a sudden manages to do some really great recruiting and pull in, like, an extra 2,000 players. Those 2,000 players, especially if they're all in more or less the same time zone, they're like you're going to have people fighting over the same anomalies. They're going to be too crowded. You're not going to have enough space for them all to earn the maximum amount of money that they would want to earn. And in those cases, it may be beneficial for you to expand your territory so you have more places to put these guys. And also, you'll have more pilots to defend that extra space. 
it kind of works out. Now, whether or not that will actually happen for you is dependent on your relationships with everybody else. You know, say... JESUS! Thank you, Rybar. Uh, Fidelis Constance, for instance, might not appreciate you wanting to double the space that you own at the expense of stations they currently own. And depending on what, how your, pol your, your political game is going, you know, you might be able to arrange a transfer of space. You might be able to talk to them and go, hey, well, let's have a coalition war against these other guys, and I'll move into that new region we conquer, and then you can have the space that we currently have. Something like that. Those kinds of deals are done all the time. Um, or, you know, things could break down, and, and you might be forced to go to war against someone. Uh, whether you invent a new reason for that or not is entirely up to you and your alliance. It could be just like, hey, we need more space, or it could be these guys have been shit allies, um, they did this or that, you know, we gotta go to war against them for those reasons, just to kind of lampshade it. Um, it really depends on what your situation is. And uh, hi, Anish, I do remember you. Uh, let's see, let's see. Zned77, welcome to the stream, says, What do you think Goons is going to do with the insane amount of mining they're doing? I think they're putting it all into super caps, and I think they are going to attempt to take away super capital superiority from NC Dot and Pandemic Legion. Strategically, that is the only thing holding Goons from back. It's one of the only reasons they lost World War B, is they were unwilling to deploy those super capitals because they were about even or maybe slightly outnumbered, no one is really sure, because those numbers are kept very closely guarded. Um, but certainly they didn't feel as confident as PL and NC DOT felt about deploying capital ships, especially super capital ships. So I think they're going to build lots of capitals, because they're basically the new battleship. They're very powerful and relatively cheap, uh, especially for an alliance like Goons. I think they're going to put as many members and carriers and dreads and faxes as they can. And then I think they're going to try to win the super capital arms race against NC Dot and PL. And once they do, I don't know what they're going to do with it. I don't want to say that they're going to start a war with it. They probably won't. But it will be their security. They'll finally have that ability to deter NC Dot and PL from their aggression, which will make them more secure with the holding. Excuse me, the strategic holdings that they currently have. I don't know for sure that that's how things are going to play out, but that is my theory. I doubt they'll really expand because you know they they don't want to overextend. They're too smart for that in terms of organization. But they may want to get some revenge either against Test and Circle of Two or go against NC dot PL directly at some point. That I wouldn't put past them. Ooh. I'm thirsty as fuck. <laughs> uh, Tweak87 asks Are all alliances military based or are some only interested in industry? There are certainly some in industry only alliances for sure but it's unlikely that industry only alliances make it out to null second one piece The reason for that is uh, holding space is fundamentally a military activity. Certainly if you're mining a lot, it increases the defensive capabilities of your, uh, of your systems. If you're really good at production and trading and movement, you're going to be well stocked in terms of ships, but you still need pilots to fly those ships. You know, your systems aren't going to de you know, defend themselves, and, you know, the nodes aren't going to capture themselves. Well, they will, but not, not efficiently. So if you plan on being in the space holding game, you need to be able to field a fleet. Which means your mining alliance better be willing to fight. 
and most pure industry alliances are fundamentally composed of players that are not interested in doing that. So they have a really tough time. What you usually see happens is some industry-only alliances will rent from these larger groups and rely on the PvP alliances to defend them. Or you'll see large mining corporations join already established military alliances as a finch effectively their Care Bear wing. And uh, at that point it's more of a hybrid alliance. And I would say that's common for most of the game. Uh, certainly not all. Like, uh, you know, PL and NC aren't fucking mining. <laughs> not in any, like, serious way. But, you know, Solar is mining, Test is mining, Goons are mining. They got miners. But they're not industrial alliances by any means. I would like to see a system where they, you know, being industrial was more of a thing, like there were more industry specific upgrades or there was a trade-off where if you wanted to go all military in your upgrades you couldn't also go all mining, you had to do a little bit of a pick and choose and maybe mining was economically viable in certain cases. You might see more of it but at some point, like I said, you're going to need PvPers to do it. So either your mining alliance is willing to fight, which most of them aren't, or you've got really good friends that you're either paying or just are lucky enough to politically have that will do the fighting for you. That's not very common. Guys, we're coming up on two and a half hours. Ooh-wee. Ooh-wee. <laughs> that, uh, that is a lot of time. So if anyone has a, a closing question, maybe do another eight minutes here, then I'm going to take a break. I'm starting to lose my voice a little bit, and i got pending slacks and pending Skypes that i got to get to. Uh, does anyone have any, any closing questions? Staring at my chat intently. If anyone out there in the Twitterverse, or excuse me, the Twitchverse. Well, I guess we're Twitterverse. We can check Twitter. Who be tweeting me? But yeah. Uh, Malicite says, thanks for the info and for answering questions. Yeah, anytime, man. Thanks for coming by and supporting the stream. I think you followed me already, but if you haven't, make sure you do. I go live at least once a week. Uh, we're trying to record Declarations of War live now. I'm, I try to stream more than once a week, but it can be tough with my schedule sometimes. Um, but I, I do what I can. And it's usually either stuff like this, where I'm doing seminars, or I'm doing PvP. Peek says, is the Imperium done being the most powerful alliance? Yeah. Uh, Imperium is, is no longer a, a real thing. Um, I don't know if Goonswarm officially retained that name for their coalition, but the coalition is extremely fractured. It's Goonswarm, Bastion, Initiative, Red Alliance, and Dream Fleet. That's essentially what's left of the Imperium. So they may officially call themselves the Imperium, I know they rebranded their Jesus! website like that, but they are no longer uh, like the Imperium that once controlled this entire area. And part of Fountain as well. Um, Imperium used to be like this big, multiple alliances. No longer. Malicite, thank you for the follow. Much appreciated. Yeah, I, I feel a little bad for Volt. Like Volt, Cold Steel, Kamwafa, 
I, I just don't see any of those alliances retaining their space between now and January. I just don't think that's going to happen. I, w I would be very, very shocked, very shocked, if that part of the map still looks how it looks right now by the time we hit 2018. This would have a fair chance of staying put. That? No, no, no. The, uh... Between the outpost upgrades and the new, um... Is it, uh... Not Sancho Shipyard. Blood Raider Shipyard. Uh, between those two features. And that's, that's going to be pretty valuable space right there, held by pretty weak alliances. I think Cold Steel is pretty good, but they're small. And Voltition Cult is like a shittier FCON, if that's possible. <laughs> like, I give them kudos for willing to, to try and go out on their own, especially after they had a falling out with the Pravi block where they used to live. But they are like a Darwin's Award waiting to happen. <laughs> Any other questions, comments from the chat? A shittier FCON? Yeah, if you can believe it, mining permit. I mean, they're... They've got all the FCON hallmarks, but without the numbers, and without the at least willingness to fleet up for things. I, I know it, it doesn't seem possible, but it's one of those miracles of modern science. Somehow the, an alliance was created that was in fact shittier than FCON. Uh, last one, Tweak. What is the best way to stay up to date in EVE politics? Well, there are three ways, really. Four ways. One, keep an eye on this map, the Verite Influence map. You can see the URL up there in my browser. You've also got... Uh, okay, I'll get to that in a bit. Uh, you've also got um, the news sites, particularly Crossing Zebras, excellent site, crossingzebras.com. There's my own podcast, which you absolutely need to be subscribed to, Declarations of War. We cover a lot of this stuff... Uh, you know, we don't cover every area with with tons of depth. It really depends on on what's active where and how much information we can get about it. But if you want a nice high level overview of what's happening with the Eve political and PvP meta, the Declarations of War podcast is the thing to do. Uh, that is the DeclarationsofWar.com URL you see at the bottom center of the stream. Give me a subs uh, like follow, subscription, whatever you call it on iTunes, or just check the site regularly. We have an RSS feed as well. And uh, finally, there is a Slack called the Tweet Fleet Slack, and that is a pretty uh, good way to keep up with things if you're into being really social. It's very busy. You know, you're going to get a lot of uh, lot of traffic, but a lot of the, the major players of EVE are on there. Uh, so there's a lot of conversation that goes on, they have entire channels which are dedicated to RSS feeds of various blogs and news sites. So if you're into that kind of stuff, you can sort of follow what's happening. Uh, also, Reddit. Uh, the EVE subreddit is pretty active. Some of it's very meme -y, some of it's very shitposty, but anytime there's like a big battle, um, you know, usually the battle report and some video will find its way on there, and that's a good way to keep Jesus! up with what's happening. Thank you, Mining Permit. Oh, it's covering up all the fun parts of that GIF. God damn it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great GIF that it's it's totally missing out on. Although I guess if you're a Simpsons fan, you're picking up on what that is. I'll have to change it at some point. Uh, but thank you very much for the support. Uh, anyone else, if you want to catch this stream again, give me a follow right now. We about to go off. Follow this channel. I'm going to be back. Possibly I'm going to stream again tonight. I don't know. Uh, but I need to give my voice a rest for a bit. And, uh, yeah, I will catch you guys at minimum next week.
probably a lot sooner. In fact, definitely sooner, because we're going to be streaming Declarations of War live this weekend. It's going to be a little bit earlier than the posted time on Sunday. I will adjust the Twitch event to the actual time once it's finalized. We're going to have a great guest on. It's going to be Reyna Thiel from the Theomaki tournament. He organizes one of the best, in fact, the best EVE live event of the year. And he is going to be on the show talking about the event, talking about what goes into promoting that kind of thing, joining us to talk about stuff like new developments in EVE politics and upcoming changes to the game. It's going to be a great show, so definitely tune in for that. Should get released uh, for recording Sunday. Should get released about Monday or Tuesday, work permitting. Um, might be able to get it done Sunday night, but it usually doesn't work out that way. Uh, definitely subscribe to the show before then. Uh, can't miss content. <laughs> All right, that's enough shilling from me. Uh, well, actually, no one more. If anyone's looking for a corp, I could always use a few cool stream viewers that want to get in on it to join the capitalist army. That's uh, my corp. Bunch of great dudes doing trade, manufacturing, and PvP in low sec. Good stuff. And with that, I'm out. Goodbye, guys. Thank you, Tweak, Malicite. I'll give everybody shoutouts in the chat here. We got Mello, Cassidy Sky, Chat DB, Cortex Burn, Dresd, Esco, Cravidius, Fagwent, Ghost 37B, King Bahia, Mello Site and Mining Permit, Rybar 80, Sedonis, Sequayagatska, I'm going to go with, or Sequayatsaiga, if you're a. Uh, and they knew Yasha fan. We got Stop Sign 139. We got Tweak 87. We got Vanguard 84. And we got my longtime friend and Eve veteran, Zareli, a.k.a. Zareli Anzo, a.k.a. the best non-noir FC to ever be in any kind of noir-related group uh, that we've ever joined or worked with. Jesus! Uh, he's an awesome dude. He is very much missed in Eve. Please come back. Preferably on my team. <laughs> All right, guys, take it easy.